Good morning, church. Hate to bother half the churches back there at the cafe. That's okay. I was going to bring my hot chocolate to show you, tell you that we have drinks at the cafe, but more than half of you are already over there, so I guess I don't have to advertise anymore. It's sure welcome to see you. It's great. It's Palm Sunday. Uh, the neighbor across the way here used to have a donkey. I wanted to bring palm leaves and the donkey in the church, but donkey moved on. So no donkey today, but maybe next week, or next year. And then next week is Easter. That is the best time to invite somebody to come to church with you. So you might have to go pick them up, whatever they need to do. Uh, try to get them here for Easter. Andrew's going to have a great Easter service. We're going to sing some great Easter songs. We'll have some good worship. All right, again, thank you for being here. God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for, as we become Christians, you give us the Holy Spirit. We're excited about next week when we have several people being baptized to be able to confirm their faith in you and say, I want to follow in baptism so it tells the world that I'm now a Christian. This is a great day. We pray for a great week during spring break. And we all pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You couldn't. Good morning. If you guys want to stand with us, let's go ahead and start singing. We got Palm Sunday today, so we're going to sing Holy, Holy, Holy. One of those, one of those words comes straight out of Scripture. It's kind of great. So. Okay. <laughs>
Oh 
children ages three years to fifth grade are dismissed to children's church. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Man, it was a week for us. Anyone else have a week? We've got a couple of sick kiddos. In fact, Kim is still home with one. It's always harder when the kids are sick. You know, when you can't do anything, you feel bad for them. But it happens, I guess. We survive. We persevere. Got a few announcements today for you. We have Easter next Sunday. We are actually going to be having five baptisms, by the way. They just kept on piling up. So we're going to be dunking some folks on Easter. And I'm going to shorten my sermon to make up for it. So it's like a double blessing right there, isn't it? Small groups this week, it's spring break. So the women's small group and the Tuesday one, we're not going to be meeting this week because of, you know, vacation and stuff like that. And the men's group will be meeting. They're the cool ones. Warriors and youth group will also not be meeting due to spring break. I have one other announcement. That is a thing called Financial Peace University. This is a new small group. It kind of is tied into the whole money series I've been doing. If you haven't heard before, you can go look him up. It's a guy named Dave Ramsey or Financial Peace University. That's going to be starting the Sunday after Easter, and it's going to be from 4 to 6 here at the church. Now, that's going to be $100. Or no, $80, I think you said. $80 if you are interested in that. If you can't afford it or you need some help, the church will help you with that. In fact, I will pay for it myself. This is an important one. If you're going to take one small group this year, this is the one I recommend. It can change your life. It can be important. And it also ties into what I'm going to be talking about today. If you ever want to contact or know more about that, you can talk to Keith or myself, or there are these connect cards in the chairs in front of you. Their size just to be dropped in the offering plate at the end of the service. So if you ever have a prayer request or anything else, you can always fill out one of these. Last thing, do have a youth summit coming up here. It's going to be April 26th to 27th. Keith wanted me to mention it again because it's not just open to youth. There are a couple sessions open to the public as well, and it has a lot of apologetics and stuff like that. If that's something that interests you, science and how that ties into Christianity, got that coming up as well. Okay. That's all my responsibilities, right, Keith? I did it? We're good? There is a free lunch at Ooh. Well, if you weren't interested before, there you go. Now you know. All right, let's talk about money. Now, I feel a little bit guilty these past couple Sundays because I've been kind of a downer. It's not always fun to be the guy getting your face to you're doing it wrong or this or that. And I can understand if after the last couple of weeks you're like, you know what, Andrew? I'm not your biggest fan right now. I don't like you. I apologize. I did say you don't have to agree with me. It's okay to disagree, and that's all right. But this week, I, I think we're going to be able to get on the same page. Because this is the last one. This is the fun sermon. We're going to talk today about having fun with money. Enjoying money. Let's do a quick review just of what we've covered so far. One of the ideas you have to get from the Bible and this whole God thing is from God's perspective, he created the whole world. He created the gold. He created the trees. All the stuff that we use to build and make things, God did it. So in a way, we're really renters here on earth. We live here, but we didn't build this. We didn't create it. And so in God's eyes, we are giving back to him. He gives to us, and he wants us here. But there's an ownership issue. Your money should belong to God in that perspective. You should be living on less than what you make. You will be happier in life if you do. It's nice to have money around because it affects us emotionally. It affects our stability. In light of that, the Bible does talk about avoiding debt. Now, it is a part of life. I get it. You're not weird or abnormal if you have debt. But if you have less going out, you have more to spend, right? And it is important to save for a rainy day because you know it's going to rain. Something's going to happen. The car is going to break down. There's going to be something you need to do, right? That's all the boring stuff we've covered so far. So let's get to the good stuff. All right? Let's talk about building wealth. How many of you would like to be wealthy? Let's talk about how to share money, how to enjoy money. Because this is actually just as important. It really is. You see, we're going to talk about saving and spending money today. Because spending 
is where it gets good. Now, you do need this whole budget thing. I'm not going to say that that goes out the window. In fact, I've got a quote from Rachel Cruz, one of the Financial Peace University, that study I was talking about. She put it this way, a budget doesn't limit your freedom, it gives you freedom. Now, for those of you that budgeting is a bad word, this might not make sense at first, but let me explain. When you're doing your budget, you need to have money set aside for fun things. And when you do that, you should go out and spend it conscious-free. Enjoy it. You should have money in your life set aside for you to have a good time to relieve some stress, to get those shoes you've been looking at, or to go out for a nice meal. These are important things. And you shouldn't have this weight around your neck, like this anchor holding you down when you do it. It's important to set aside some money. And when you deal with a budget and you handle your money wisely, this is part of what should be in there. Over in Ecclesiastes, it says this, I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every person who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. This is a gift of God. It's important to set aside some money to rejoice. It's important to acknowledge here you should eat and drink. You should have a good time. Your labor pays, and you need to have some time to enjoy that. Most people fall into two categories when it comes to money. You have free spirits, and you have the nerds. You know what I'm talking about? The nerds are the one who actually enjoy doing the budget. They, they sit there, they calculate the numbers, they get it all right, and it's balanced perfectly. I see some of you smiling at the person next to you. And they bring it to you like it's some kind of an art project. Look, and you're like, I don't want anything to do with this. Because that's the other person, isn't it? The free spirits. The budget is the chain. I don't want anything to do with it. It's boring. It puts rules on me. I would like to enjoy my life. Stop being a downer. Which one are you? There's problems with both. You see, the free spirits, they're the ones that just burn through money. You know what I'm talking about? It's like they've got a campfire in front of them. And they're like, hey, check out. This stuff's flammable. Money. It warms my hands. I don't need to buy a heater. I'm already warm. No long-term plan. Now, you nerds are laughing right now, but oh, you're not getting out for easy. Look, I'm the nerd. I understand. But this is the nerd version. Free spirits, see if this sounds familiar to you. They come to you. Serious. Honey, I've had a breakthrough. If we only eat every other day, we will save 50% on the grocery budget. And you look at them like, you're crazy. And you're trying to explain to this to them why this doesn't work out. They're like, no, 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 no. I'm sure the children will be fine. It won't cause any permanent damage. OK, you need both, all right? Nerds, I understand, and we, I appreciate that you're actually getting the money in order. And there is a lot of value in that. That needs to happen. But you know what happens? Sometimes as a nerd, what we do is we just hold too tight and too long, and eventually, the pattern I see with a lot of nerds is they finally break from not ever having any fun or letting off any stress, and they spend a bunch of money at once. That's me. Also, like, when I blow money, it's like in the hundreds, you know what I mean? I'll scrimp and eat ramen and then just blow it somewhere. Your free spirit is important because they're the one that's going to actually teach you to enjoy life a little bit. And you need to do that. So, nerds, when you're doing the budget, talk to your free spirit. First of all, you need a line item for what I call spending money or fun money. And you should have separate ones, by the way, where I can go out and spend money on whatever I want without having an issue. For me, it's usually some game on Steam or something like that, some little indie title. I just, I just want to blow off and just zone for a while. Kim, maybe she buys a pair of shoes, or maybe she's hitting Starbucks and just enjoying a nice drink. The thing is, I don't have to tell her where I'm spending the money on. She doesn't have to tell me. It's set aside for that purpose. 
Now, on top of that as well, if you are married, you should have some money you do spend together. We call that our date money. And that's important too. Money set aside for us to go out and relax. For the two of us, usually that's a restaurant. We like to go and eat somewhere a little bit nicer, basically nice enough there aren't a lot of kids around, and most importantly, there are not our kids around, right? And so we do that. We actually have a line item just called dates. And that's where we go to relax, to have that moment. Now, the flip side of this is when the money in the budget is gone, stop spending. Let's be responsible. Let's be adults. I know. But if you need the more money, then when you do the budget again, go ahead and raise up the spending money. Here's a fact. If you're trying to like pay off debt or save up money, if you hamper the spending money too much, you'll find you never keep your budget because you're not taking care of yourself. There is a balance there. And it's okay to maybe tighten it down for a little bit, but long term, you're going to crack. And God wants us to enjoy life. And you should have some short and long-term goals as well. Because money is supposed to be something that we can enjoy. You like sports? What if you saved up and actually went and saw your team in person? Get a hotel. Take the missus, take her out to dinner to make it even, whatever it is. Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe she's the sports aficionado. I don't know. If you haven't gotten a home yet, maybe that's something you want to save up together. You have a dream together. It's kind of fun when you start looking on Zillow and stuff like that. Looking at maybe actually buying a place, a place to have of your own. For those of you who already have a home, man, there's just always something to remodel, isn't there? There's landscaping you could do. You could redo the kitchen. There's all these little things. You know, pick one. Every month, start setting some money aside. Dream a little bit. Maybe you've had too many staycations in a row and you like to go somewhere. Why couldn't you go to Europe? Or the coast or whatever it is you want to do. When you have a budget and when you get your finances in line, it unlocks things like this. And it's an important part of it. When Kim and I finally paid off of all of our debt, because we did this Dave Ramsey class thing, we, we only really have our mortgage left. We paid off everything else. And it was freeing for us. It was huge. I cannot speak highly enough of that class. But we decided to celebrate. We did the classic American vacation. What did we do? We went to Disneyland. And we had a blast. Now, I'll be honest. I am like the hermit type of vacation person. I go somewhere and I pretend like the world doesn't exist anymore. That's more my style. Disneyland was not something I thought I was going to enjoy. But you know what? It was a lot of fun. It really was. They do a good job. That's this whole experience. We had to save up a lot of, I don't know if you looked at the price of Disneyland. When my wife showed me that, I kind of had a little bit of a, <gasps> really? But I'm glad we did it. There were a lot of cool memories there. It was a lot of connections. Now, was it overnight we just decided to go? No, we, we, we spent some time, about a year, saving up some money so we could do it. But we also planned. And when we went, we didn't just barely afford it. We had spending money, a big pile of spending money ready to go. We just ate there. We did all the extra little things. I bought some stupid robot that was like 80 to 100 bucks for my children. They haven't played with it a day since. But it was okay, because it was in the budget. Stuff like this has value, and sometimes we tend to overlook this side of things. You are meant to enjoy life. God is your Father in heaven. He loves you. He wants this as well. And when you take care of yourself, when you're able to have money be a source for fun, for enjoyment, it unlocks things in you. Not only can you start taking care of yourself, you can also begin looking to others. And that's what I want to talk about next, is this idea of generosity, of giving, of not being locked down with money. You know, 
a good way to think of it is either an open hand or a closed fist. When it comes to money, which one is it for you? Are you holding on to it tight because you're afraid? Because you don't know if it's going to last till the end of the month? Or is it greed or something else? Or is it an open hand where, yeah, you have it, and you're willing to give it because you know more is coming? Is there a peace about it? Or is there a worry, a doubt? Which one is it going to be? There's a saying that content people use money for good instead of letting money use them for evil. When you're at a healthy place with money, it changes everything. Now, we're talking about generosity, so what I'm going to talk about next is the one you've probably all been waiting for, all right? Because anytime a pastor talks about money, what is he going to eventually talk about? Right. He's going to talk about tithing, right? So let's do it, all right? Everyone's been waiting for the shoe to drop. I know you have. It's like pastor's preaching three weeks from now. He's going to talk about tithe for three weeks. So here it is. Here's the shoe. It's dropping. Could you hold on that for me? Thank you. <laughs> all right. So tithing. It is an important part for church, and it is something we should talk about. But I want to be very frank when I talk to you about tithing. First of all, where does it actually come from? Well, it comes from the Old Testament, back in Leviticus. Now, all the tithe of the land, of the seeds of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If, therefore, someone should ever want to redeem part of his tithe, he shall add it to a fifth of it. For every tenth part of herd or flock, whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. That's where it comes from. Back in the Old Testament times, people would take 10% and give it to the temple. And that was very similar to today. That helped take care of the priests at the temple to feed them, to take care of anything, the needs and stuff like that. And it's similar here today. It helps us keep the lights on. It helps pay Pastor Keith and my salary, events, things, things like that. It pays for the donuts and the Italian sodas that everyone seems to like oh so much. These are the things that it goes into. It's not complicated. We actually just finished our budget for this year, and that's going to be something we're sharing. If you're ever curious about where we're spending money, you can find that out. Now, as far as tithing goes, you do not have to tithe. In fact, statistically, the last one they did shows that 75 to 90 percent of people who attend church don't tithe. So to be honest, if you don't tithing, you're the majority. That's, that's just the truth of it. And that's okay. We still love you. We still want you to be here. Now, why would you tithe? Why would you give? Honestly, if you believe in what we're doing here and you support that, I would ask you to consider giving some amount of money. Now, if you're a member here, I would ask if you're going to support us, please do give something financially that way, because it is something that does affect us. Now, some people I've also heard, Pastor Keith is talking about this, some people come up and say, Pastor, I don't tithe, but if you ever have a need, let me know. I'll help. That's great. I actually do have a need. It's called our electric bill. It happens every month. I understand. I appreciate that. But honestly, giving from month to month helps us the most. Because that way we can budget responsibly. Because just like all of you and myself have a home budget that we work on, the church should be responsible too. And so if we need to cut how we're spending, we'll do that. Now, as far as how much should you give, well... That one I'll go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Each one must do just as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Here's what I would say. If you feel like you want to support us and you can tithe, thank you. But you know what? If you only want to give a smaller amount, that's okay too. When Kim and I started this whole Dave Ramsey thing, and we were trying to get out of debt, we tithed $50. There was no percentage. That was just, we looked at our budget and we're like, huh, we messed up. We need to get out of this hole. And for a while there, we just tithed $50 a month. Partly because we wanted 
to have that effect on us, to do that. So if you can tithe $5, great. $50, fine. Now, as we got better financially, yeah, we moved it up. But whatever amount you feel like you can give or you want to is fine. If you'd rather not, that's fine too. That's my personal opinion where I would go on the whole tithe thing. So she was done. Drop the other one. Can I get those back after service? Thanks. What I want to do, though, a little bit here is talk about the effects that giving has on people. Regardless of whether or not you decide to give to the church or not, I do believe you should be giving to something. Not because of what it does for that place or whoever or whatever it is you're giving to, but because of the change it makes in you. Let me put it to you this way. Over in Proverbs, a generous person will be prosperous, and the one who gives others plenty of water will himself be given plenty. One who withholds grain, the people will curse him, but blessing will be on the head of him who sells it. When we look at giving, it changes your relationship with money. It goes back to that whole thing I talked about before. With an open hand and a closed fist, giving is part of what opens that hand up. It changes the way you think about money. Over in 1 Timothy, it says it this way. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so they may take hold of that which is truly life. God asks us to set aside money and use money for good. This is the way I would say it. When you purposefully set aside money for good, it changes your relationship with it. So many times in our lives, money is this source of negative emotion, of hardship. When you decide to take some of that money and use it for something good, something you believe in, something you support, Support, it changes the way you think about it. Money is no longer this master of you. Instead, you're taking some of your money and using it for something else. Now, this can be a lot of things. It can be in many different things. Now, if you don't want to do church, that's fine. In fact, in the Dave Ramsey class, they talk about tithing and stuff like that, but they also have a lot of people who are not Christians who take the class. And they tell them to give as well, because it changes who you are. If I wasn't a Christian, Kim and I would probably give to a foundation called the Nephrotic Syndrome Foundation. Our son Peter has Nephrotic Syndrome. What it means is his kidneys are bad. We ended up at Dornbecker for like a week. And this foundation came alongside us in our time of need. Because it's a bunch of parents and people who have kids with the same issue. So if we're going to give, that's probably what we would do. In fact, I still, even though we're Christians and we tie to the church, as we get better financially, I would like to give something back to them because I do believe in what they're doing. We also stayed at the Ronald McDonald House. When we were there, our son was in Dornbecker. We needed a place to stay. It wasn't planned. It was an emergency. That's another ministry that I believe in that I would support. If you don't want to give to the church, like I said, that's fine. We still love you. We still want you here. But I do encourage you, give to something. Build something. Help something grow. Take the money you make and make something better with it. It changes the way it feels. It changes the way you think about it. To bless someone else, it becomes a tool for good that you are wielding to help others. 
And that's important. Because as you continue to build wealth, your life is going to change. And that's a good thing. I talked at the very beginning about how God has nothing against being rich. He would love for you to be rich. He's your father. He wants good things for you. Many people in the Bible were very wealthy. Why not you? Right? There's a lot of ways we can look at this. But the one I really want to do is to stop for a second and slow down. Close your eyes. Dream with me for a little bit. Okay? What if the money in Avaya was different? What if you didn't have all those debts? What if you didn't have a car, credit card? What if you didn't even have a mortgage or renting bill? What would that change? What if you had a few hundred grand in the bank? What if you had a million? What would you do? Is that something you'd work towards? Because that's something that excites me. And that can be you. There's nothing blocking that. Have I caught your attention now? This is actually what got me fired up to change about money. Over in Proverbs 28, it says, A faithful person will abound with blessings, but one who hurries to be rich will not go unpunished. I'm not here with some kind of get-rich scheme. I'm not going to tell you, if you give to our church, God will bless you. No, it's going to rain. <laughs> Save some money for when it happens. All right? But what if you could change the way you interact with money? What if it could be better than where you're at? You know, you need to be saving something. And there's a few different ways to do it. At a base level, I'm not a financial planner. Everyone, you've got that 401k at work, or 403b, or whatever those, those weird numbers. They're, they even match it sometimes. Try to be investing. Try to save your future. Mutual funds, all that stuff. You don't have to understand it. Talk to someone else. Research it. Set aside something. If you've got the money, I, real estate's crazy around here, right? Maybe that blocks most of us from being able to invest, and that's okay. But there are options out there. There are people that can help. This class we're talking about goes through all of this kind of stuff. It talks about changing that, not locking yourself into where you're at with money now, but beginning to think about what it could be. And honestly, the trick here is just to begin saving something, building wealth. Because honestly, we all want to be able to provide for our future. There's a big reason to save. And I'm going to call my son Jackson as my witness for this. Now, you guys have seen these pictures before, right? The first day of school. This was Jackson's first day of preschool, four years old. Now, my son is very intelligent. He was ahead of his time. I don't know if you can read it up there, but if you zoom in here a little bit, when I grow up, I want to be retired. That's not bad, right? You know, the older I get, <laughs> the more I'd like to be retired. You know what I mean? Saving money and building wealth is an important part of that. What if you could retire and do what you wanted to do? To have that freedom. You know, I talked at the very beginning of this whole thing of how much money does a person need? And the famous quote is, Another dollar? I bet you if you ask most of the people here who have retired how much more they wish they had saved, I bet you the answer would be another dollar, another 10, another 10 million, right? What do you want to do? I would love to be able to be retired and be able to travel a little bit, to be able to work if I want to, a job that I want to do. To be free to invest in what I actually believe in, not just have to pay the bills, to have that hobby of I'm eyeballing or interests me, or you know what, someday, not yet, to go visit the grandkids, wherever they end up in the U.S. or around the world.
There's nothing stopping us from doing these kinds of things. Money can be a blessing. You know, Proverbs 13, a good person leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren, and the wolf of a sinner is stored up for the righteous. Wouldn't it be cool to be able to leave not only money to your kids, but to your grandkids? You know, maybe you can't become a millionaire by the time you retire. But what if you can get money under control? What if you can get some dignity? And what if you start to teach your kids about it before they make the mistakes that we made? How many of you have some stupid tax you've paid in your life when it comes to money? I've got mine. What if you can learn how money is supposed to work? What if you can teach your kids? How could that change not just your dreams, but theirs? That's kind of cool, isn't it? If you're younger, listen, believe me, time is your biggest ally on this. It really is. If I could go back, I would. No, I'm still going to do the best I can and be responsible where I'm at now. But the truth of the matter is that your relationship with God is affected by your relationship with money. That's why I decided to preach this series. I know it sounds more like kind of a self-help gig or something like that. And in a way, yeah, yeah, it kind of is. Because here's the thing. If I'm telling you to read your Bible more, to be healthy, to do this and that, that's all great. But if you're paralyzed by fear and money issues in your life, and that's where all your focus is, I can tell you to read this, but that's not what you're going to do, is it? I don't blame you. But if you can change your relationship with money, if it can become a tool that betters your life, and then I start talking about God, and you get your personal life together too, well now we're healthier. We're in a better place. We can begin to go places, to have a future. If anything I've said over these last three weeks has caught your attention, whether it's talking about in the first week who God is, what God believes about money, the second week the issues with debt or emotional stress and all this baggage that sometimes Man, money just seems to pound you sometimes. You've been there? I've been there. Or maybe it's this idea of dreaming a little bit. If any of those things actually get you excited, I'm going to plug it one last time, then I'll stop. This Financial Peace University class, I'm telling you, it was one of the biggest things for me. Not only the money side, but my marriage. Because Kim and I don't have those issues with money anymore. And that's a big change. The money takes us on dates now, not on arguments. Yeah. There's a value here. Because the truth is, it does affect your life. We could say money is not important, and there's an understanding there. But when you tie it all in, when you look at this, money is a tool. It's a tool that we can use. And if we can learn to use it properly, we can be blessed by God, bless God with it, but also bless our own lives and those around us. And that's what I hope for everyone here today. Next week, we're going to be going into Easter. We're going to be talking about Jesus, who he is, the importance of that story. I hope you'll be here. I hope you'll think about some of the stuff this week. I'll be praying for you. And I hope that God will bless you, each and every one. Because you have the right to have a life with love, with joy, with happiness. Don't we all? Let's pray. 
Father, I just thank you so much for everything you've done. I thank you for the blessings and the wonders that you've given us here. I pray for your guidance and your help with money issues and things. I pray that would be a blessing to people here. They would help us to support one another, not just financially, but through love and time. I pray that as a church, we'll be able to seek you out to find you. Pray for those being baptized next week. 